go time. So here we are. Uh, welcome everybody to the Epic Real Estate Investing Show, where we show people how to invest in real estate so they can retire early. Got a great show today for you with a great guest. There's a, a million ways, as I always say, a million ways to make a million bucks in real estate. And I've got another way for you today. So if you're curious about how an ovation agreement works in real estate, you're in the right place. Uh, today, my guest will explain the basics of a novation agreement and how it can be used in a real estate transaction. We'll discuss its purpose, the different parties involved, and how it can be beneficial to all the parties that are concerned. And we'll also provide some real life examples to help you better understand how a novation agreement works in real estate. So if you're looking for an in-depth look at novation agreements and, and how they work in real estate, this video is for you. All right. So before we get started, uh, I'm getting together this weekend for a few hours online with some newer investors to help them get their first flip done. Uh, rumor has it, what's old is new again. So if you'd like to join us, you can go to firstflipfasttrack.com. It's been quite the tongue twister around the office, but I think I'm finally getting the hang of it. Totally free. I'm going to be there for a few hours and we're going to go through um, the basic ways to flip a property, the nice and easiest ways with the least amount of resistance. And then we're going to uh, go over how to get your deals actually under contracts. That's really the, the bread and butter of a real estate investing business. That's where the real skill is. And I'm going to show, go through a number of different ways for how you can attract these opportunities to you, these motivated sellers. And that's whether you are broke, whether you're on a budget or whether you are a baller. I got something for you. All right. So that's at the first flip fast track uh, this Saturday, February 25th. And that starts at 9 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. Alrighty, so let's get on with uh, the real reason you're here today, and that's to talk about innovation agreements. Let's cut to the chase. And I've got a great guest. He's done, I think the last I read, over a thousand of them. He's been doing them for a very long time. So I consider him an expert and he's here to answer your questions and we're here to get to know him. And let's welcome him to the Epic family. Eric, welcome to the show. Thanks, ma'am. Good to see you. Likewise, uh, we're being broadcast all over the interwebs today. Uh, if you're watching on Facebook, Apparently, I can't see your chats, so I'm not ignoring you. But if you're on YouTube, we can see your chats. And if you got some questions, go ahead and fire away and we'll get to it. Um, perfect. So I guess, Eric, let's just start by I know you've done a bunch of these deals. We have a lot of mutual <coughs> friends. I want to get to know you better. I want to know more about these innovation agreements. But let's start. Uh, what got you involved in real estate in the first place and bring me up to where you are today? Uh, yeah, I um, I spent um, a few years after high school. I joined the U.S. Army. Uh, did my time in the U S army, came home, um, ended up getting a job at a local car dealership and, uh, slowly, but surely worked my way up through the car business, um, from a lot attendant to a service manager, to a salesperson, to a finance manager, and eventually to a general sales manager. And, uh, after eight years, got a little burned out of the car business. Um, I had recently just had my first child and uh, knew that I had to make a choice between the demands of being a good car guy or the demands of being a good dad and made the decision to um, get out of the car business and started searching for a new career and um, actually figured real estate would, would be a good fit and alignment with the skill set that I felt that I had. And um, I had sold some cars to real estate agents and remember filling out their credit applications and how much money they had made and um knew how much i worked and what what i thought i knew that they were working and seemed to be a good bit less and um had a pretty good background in finance in the car business and um it gave me a pretty good advantage um over other dealerships other salespeople, understanding leases and special finance and creative finance and so when i decided to get into real estate i thought finance would be an appropriate place to kind of cut my teeth so um, interviewed at a few mortgage companies and took a job with Comfort Home Mortgage, was a local place here back in 2005, um, and basically was doing cold calling, pitching refis in 2005. And like my fourth phone call, I locked up a loan, made like five, six grand, and I was like, whoa. Like, a glorious day. Yeah, like what in the world? That was way easier than I expected. So. I got pretty good at that. And after doing it for about six months, um, the owner of the dealership who had been my mentor for my eight years in the car business um, was exiting, um, selling the, the car 
uh, auto dealership. It was a Toyota uh, franchise mm -hmm. and um, was experimenting in real estate and wanted to build a real estate company and thought of me and we went to lunch and um, I left the mortgage company and him and I opened up a house flipping company. And uh, so that was 2006 <clears throat> and we bought a couple of properties. Perfect time to start flipping houses. It was a wild ride for the first two years. I can tell you that. Yeah. But um, yeah, so it was it was really cool that in 2006, like it was hard to buy something, but once you got a deal and fixed it up, it would sell pretty quick for full price. Yeah. And uh, we did about I think our first full year, like 70 some flips, and then um, the next year we inched our way up to 100, and then 150, and then after about three years, we were doing about 200 deals a year, and um, yeah, so then. 2008 came along and yeah and you know we made a pivot back then and you know had some deals that went south because of the you know market changes back then and started doing installment sales agreements and actually discovered discovered novations in and around that window between 2008 and 2010 because fha deed seasoning became a real problem for me as a house flipper because i'd buy a house renovate it in three weeks put it on the market get an offer but they couldn't close for yeah. four months Mm -hmm. so that's how I that's how I discovered innovations and then like a year later started using them. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, that's that's sort of how I got my start in real estate. Super. Yeah, we got started just about the same time. I, I think I got started as an investor about a year after you. I was an agent for a few years before that. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, so yeah, we got a lot of experience. And you know, when I first heard of this thing, innovation, it started getting really popular. I don't know, just about a year and a half, two years ago, it was kind of moving through the internet and it was becoming a common phrase. And, you know, I've always been the creative financing guy from the very beginning. I don't really, I was totally unlendable when I got started. I had almost no cash to speak of. So I had to get creative. Right. And I heard of this novation thing and everyone was talking about it and people were asking me about it. I was like, Oh crap. I don't know what a novation is. I better figure this out. And so I went and looked it up real quick and I was like, Oh, that's what it is. Got it. So I think my very last listing as a real estate agent, uh, Mercedes was actually just was on the show of uh, flip that house, my wife and my very last uh, deal as a, as a list, uh, my very last listing. We kind of came across this type of situation where they wanted more for their house. And I was like, you're not going to get it unless you fix it up. And they're like, we don't have the money to fix it up. And then that's kind of all formulated. And we had an attorney come in and just kind of drew it up with a trust type format. And uh, so I was like, oh, I know what an innovation is. I've done one before. I just didn't know what they were called. So. I felt better about yeah. myself. <laughs> so but, that's, uh, why don't you go ahead and explain kind of what it is? So that is, that's an application of a novation that um, is very much different than, than the way that I'm using it. Um, I think for the longest time, novations were used, and this is probably why it wasn't as popular. It was used as a fix and flip method. So it required a renovation and it required some type of memorialized partnership with the seller. Mm -hmm. And if you just think about those two things, right, there's a lot of moving parts like construction's kind of hard. Partnerships are kind of hard. Partnerships with renovations with homeowners, really hard. Right. Um, so the way that I use novations is no renovations. I'm, I'm not remodeling the property at all. Um, I'm not well, borrowing. Kind of start, Eric, just kind of explain what it actually is. Oh, I got you. Yeah. So innovation and it's simplest terms is the replacement of an agreement or a term inside of an agreement. So if you think about it in that context, the normal wholesale deal would be an assignment of your equitable interest. You, you're actually, your, your contract is the mechanism that generates revenue. Right. When you do innovation, your contract is conditionally released because you can't have two contracts that are enforceable at the same time, right? The one that would be enforceable is the one that came first. So when you think about an assignment wholesale, you generally have to sell to a cash buyer or someone using hard money lending because that's <clears> the way an assignment works. Right. You can't send an assignment to an FHA, VA, USDA, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac borrower. It's not a lendable transaction. Right. When you do a donation and you conditionally release your purchase agreement in exchange for a third party agreement, it now becomes a financeable transaction. Got it. So, like, okay, right, so we have an E to B transaction, seller and buyer, 
and you got, you're going to execute the innovation, where do you come in? Are you B or are you the end buyer? You're B. So I, I, I buy, I put a contract to buy Matt's house for $200,000. Yeah. In the language of my purchase agreement, it says I have the right to novate the property and I won't do it now for the interest of time, but you and I talk about what that really means, right? Like a seller is not going to know what that means. Um, effectively, Matt, over the course of the next 60 to 90 business days, I'm going to go out and I'm going to market the property to retail buyers to try and get someone to come in here and pay me more than what I've agreed to pay you for the property. Um, mm -hmm. And in exchange for that higher price, they may want appraisals, home inspections, more than likely they're going to bring a real estate agent to the transaction that I have to compensate through commissions. And I'm going to have to navigate through all of those relationships and those moving parts and those inspections and appraisals. And I'm going to do all of that work in the hopes that I can make a couple fistful, you know, dollars in exchange for doing all of that. Um, you know, I'd really prefer to just buy it and close and you and I come up with a price and that works great. Um, but it sounds like you need more money for this property than, than what I was able to offer you under those terms. So I'm suggesting we go this route. You get more money. I get 90 days to get this all buttoned up. You're going to give me permission to take it to the open market. I'm going to go out and market like my life depends on it to find that one buyer that may buy it in its current condition and be willing to pay me my asking price and I'll pay the agent and handle all these appraisals and all that stuff and squeak out a couple bucks for me and uh, make sure that you get the amount that you and I agree on. Um, right. So what happens is I'm A to B. When I find a retail buyer, I extinguish A to B and it goes A to C. Right. And then I memorialize that A to B contract when I release it that says, hey, Matt, remember we talked about my ability to go out and find this third party buyer. Now that we have them, you're going to sign this document that says, hey, you take on all this extra responsibility. You're handling all these commissions and inspections and appraisals and contingencies. You take on all this extra responsibility in exchange. I, as the investor, get all the upside. So I take on all of the liability in exchange. I get whatever upside shakes out at the end. Okay. So I guess it's just really um, almost semantics between the assignment and innovation, right? No, I mean, it's a real, it's a mechanical difference, like an assignment. Right. But the re end result is the same, time. yeah. What's that? The end result is the same. You just don't need a cash buyer. You can get the finance buyer is basically what it is. Yeah. So so then once you know that you can sell to finance buyers, how does that change how you evaluate a property? Or am yeah, I, am I, I don't need to use 70% minus reno. I can mm -hmm. look at its current condition value minus 15% that would cover, say, commissions, inspections, appraisals, profit. If you're selling a $350,000 house and you buy it at 85% of its current condition value, that's a big spread. And commissions mm -hmm. may cost you 5%. You give up a little bit of seller's help or something like that, which you, in some markets you got to do right now in the retail market, you can still net 10% mm -hmm. on a $350,000 property that's thirty five dollars for a house you never fixed and flipped, you never funded, you never painted, you never put new flooring in. Um, so it's, it's a wholesale style transaction on a property that's generally in wholesale condition. Got it. That's what I was just selling it to a retail buyer who can go get a loan. Yeah. They already have one when they come to you. It's yeah. It's, right now, those are the most active buyers are FHA, VA, Fannie Mae borrowers that have just enough money down. They might need seller's help because those folks couldn't buy a house the last three years with the competitive nature of the market. So now they're out in full force and they're like, Hey, I'll give you full price. You give me 5k sellers help. You let me do my inspection and appraisal. Right now. Sellers are like, yeah, you can do that. Two years ago, they go inspection. No way, Jose, you can't do an inspection right. on my house. They've got 12 other offers where they waived appraisals and inspections. Your deal's no good. Now those right. offers are being considered. So when you can take your, your properties, that you have under contract with the proper innovation language and you expose them to the retail market to FHA, VA, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac borrowers that need a little bit of seller's help and have to get an appraisal. Um, mm -hmm. Those properties are selling for full price or very close to it. And they're very successful, profitable transactions. So 
just to play devil's advocate, because I had really had a different idea of what novation meant. I just looked it up and I put the definition in and I was like, oh, that's actually not what it means at all. So good. We're learning something for sure. Um, the How is this different than just being a real estate agent? You're kind of taking the place of being an agent, right? Without the fiduciary duty? Um, I, no. no. I mean, a real estate agent, in my experience, doesn't handle inspection repairs. They don't pay for inspection repairs. They're not paying for appraisal repairs. They're not, no, it's maybe 10% of the value that a real estate agent brings might be some overlap, but you're operating like an investor. Mm -hmm. You just don't own the property yet. Right. No, I got so, it. So you're the principal, right? All right. So you're the buyer. I'm going to, the seller's not giving me the low price that I need, but it's still a, a reasonable deal that I think would be a deal on the open market. So yeah. I'm going to put it under a traditional uh, purchase agreement, right? Okay. And is it, is there have to be a clause in there, like the right to novate? Oh, hundred percent. Yeah. Okay. So that's in your purchase agreement, the original purchase agreement. Now I go out there and I market the property and I look for the end buyer. So then I find the end buyer and say, yes, I want it. So now you're bringing them to the table and you're going to connect the seller and the new buyer. One thing you just said that kind of confused me a little bit, it was, now you're going to go pay appraisal costs and everything like that. So that's your responsibility to the end buyers. Yeah. So you don't, so when, when we, I list all of my innovations with a licensed agent. Okay. Right. So they're going on the open market in the MLS. So the, to the buyer, it looks like, you know, John and Mary Smith, who's the buyer has their real estate agent and they're writing an offer to buy Bob and Mary Andrew's house. They, they, I'm not a, a visible party of the transaction. Understood. Right. So inside of the innovation language in the person agreement, it has some, you know, uh, language in there that says, hey, Matt, as a part of this, I'm going to need you to sign a, a listing agreement as the licensed owner or deeded owner of the property. Only you can physically list it on the open market. I'll connect you with my real estate agent. You'll have to sign some paperwork there. Um, again, this is all in an effort to get you up to that $200,000 you said you had to have. Um, are you OK with that? And they'll go, yeah, man, whatever it takes to get me my 200. That's fine. Um, so when it goes in the MLS, it looks like the the, the owner of the property uh -huh. has it for sale. There's just this, you know, um, recorded agreement that we have that says, hey, when this third party buyer comes along, remember, you're going to sell it directly to them. And the difference between our sale price and that sale price is mine. Our contract says as is no commissions, no fees, no inspections, whatever that contract has over and above that, I have to handle all that crap. And in exchange, that's how I get the difference in the money. Um, so we're, we explain this on the very front end of the deal, right? Because when it goes in the MLS, they're going to see it on Zillow, Redfin. Their neighbor's going to bring up to them at work that they saw their house yeah. listed for 350 grand. I thought you sold it to an investor. You got to hash all that stuff out on the front end, right? Mm -hmm. um, so you, you effectively um, come to an agreement with them. You write a contract. It gets listed in the MLS with a licensed agent, it's for sale. It looks like every other listing. Mm -hmm. And then when someone writes the contract, they're going to write the contract just like they would any buyer's agreement for any other property that was listed in the MLS. And before you can ratify that agreement, you have to execute the novation addendum. It says our original deal is now conditionally released. Now you can enter into this third party agreement. And just like we discussed, any terms or pricing over and above what you and I agreed on is 100% my responsibility. Got it. Got it. Okay, I got two questions there. And if you're you're listening and you have a question, fire away. Let, it, let us know in the chat. We're talking to Eric Brewer today of the Brewer Method and uh, done thousands of novation agreements. And this is really a hot topic and a lot of people are interested. And And I just found out personally, I was kind of confused as to what it was. I, I know I've done this structure before, but I didn't realize the, the, the different ways and angles that you can actually implement and use it. One, you said um, that agreement, the a to B contract is recorded. So you go and record that to, to protect yourself. You can record the agreement. You can record a notice of interest. Yeah. There's a number of ways that you can memorialize your interest in the property. Okay. And then kind of trying to, I'm going to try and stick with those numbers and the example that we were just talking about. So say I'm going, there's a house that's worth 250 is the ARV. I'm a wholesaler. I want to get it for 150. The seller needs 200. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's a discount on the open market, but probably not good, good enough for us as a wholesaler or a fix and flipper. 
So what yeah. we do is we say, you're, we're going to get you your 200. Now you go to the open market and say you find the buyer for 225. You can list it for whatever you want to list it for, right? Okay. So they're getting their 200 and then that 25 is yours, less all the fees and everything that you're going to take care of. Yes. That's how it works. Okay. I understand. Very good. Yeah. So generally what you'll see is like you, you said ARV, right? That's a, that's a fix and flip wholesale yeah. mechanism that we use to come up with our price. The number you're going to find that's most applicable for these deals is current condition retail. Mm-hmm. Because when you look at a house that's in really good shape and you compare it to ARV, they're almost the same number, right? Like a house that's fully renovated in most markets around that 250 number versus a house that's got, say, 10 year old renovations, but it's clean. Yeah. They're probably they're they're definitely going to appraise for the same amount because an appraiser sees a well kept 10 year old renovation yeah. the exact same way they see a brand new renovation. They're, they're generally both considered C2 condition. Right. Most buyers in today's market may be willing to pay a little bit more for that flipped inventory. Um, but at the end of the day, they're both really going to comp for the same amount. So in your instance, if it was 250 ARV, and what I find is that the ideal properties for this are really nice, right? Mm-hmm. I'm probably going to be able to list it for 250 because ARV and current condition retail value are about the same. Mm-hmm. So now when they're saying 200, there's 50 grand spread there. Maybe I list it for 240 because I want to make it way more appealing than the other properties that are out there. And right. I'm not, I'm not, you know, as an investor, I don't want to hold out for top dollar. I want quick, you know, good money, not long, uh, maybe money. So, um, but that's generally the, the idea, right? It's like, Hey, and, and when you think about that right now, you start, what am I talking about? Homes that are in good condition as wholesalers or investors, what do we generally go out and look for the most messed up house we can find? That's right. Because that's normally the condition of a property that's likely for me to be able to buy at 70% minus renovations, which ends up being like 40, 50%. Mm -hmm. And most people are going to go, no way, man, you're crazy. Like 90% of the people that you offer 40, 50% are going to tell you to go pound sand. That's right. When you're able to operate on nice properties, now you're, you know, generally wholesaling, you're looking for a needle in a haystack. It's a fixer upper owned by a distressed seller that'll sell it for 50 cents on the dollar. When you start doing novations, you go, holy moly, like literally every house that's owned by somebody that wants to sell becomes an opportunity. If I can get a 15% discount from current condition retail value on a $300,000 house, for example, that's 45K. Even after commissions and maybe I spend, we spend about $1,500 average doing FHA style repairs where the appraiser goes out and goes, Hey, you're missing a handrail at the basement. We saw some peeling paint up on the attic window and you're missing two GFCIs in the kitchen. And we'll go in and make those repairs, spend 1200 bucks. Appraiser comes out and goes, okay, it meets FHA guidelines. You can go to settlement now. Um, So you're, you know, it's almost like instead of saying we buy ugly houses, you can say, Hey, we buy decent houses. Mm -hmm. Mm Mm-hmm. There's way more decent houses out there that are owned by people that might take 85% versus the houses that are really messed up and people will take 50%. Right, right. Okay, cool. So uh, you'll go and do those small repairs. And that's where I my familiarity with the Novation was, is we went and did rehabs on houses. Yeah. We put them on the market, right? But yeah. that that the, um, the level of work that you can do, that's up to you. Whatever you think you can get on the open market, you're going to probably put in the the repairs that are going to get you the best bang for your buck, but that's like the limit to it. Right. Right. Cool. Got it. All right. So I, I would imagine, I don't know, tell me what, what is the current market conditions right now? And is it better now for innovations or was it better this time last year? It was way, everything was better this time last year when you were selling a house. Mm-hmm. Um, I would but tell you, the you know, they, is there the same? Oh yeah. I mean, cause okay. literally from like post COVID to like June of 2022, mm-hmm. you could buy a house under, put it under contract for like a hundred percent of value listed on the MLS and it would sell for 115%. True that, true that. Yep. So that was awesome. Right. I right. would say, so a year ago they were better today. They're more mandatory. Like it's hard to, to get a wholesale deal right now because Sellers still have a relative elevated value of what their house might be worth based on a market that was a year ago. Buyers, 
particularly wholesale buyers are really backing off a little bit. They're worried about interest rates. Some of them got their teeth kicked on on a flip a year ago um, where they bought it and were halfway through a renovation and rates went to 7% by the time they listed it. I know guys in yeah. Las Vegas and Reno, Nevada that lost 200 grand on flips because they the timing was just bad. Um, yeah. So right now, um, I'm like, it's 50% of the deals I do. We'll do 35 deals this month and 16, 17 of them are novations. Mm -hmm. Um, because more, more leads that come in are properties that are in decent condition owned by motivated sellers versus wholesale deals that are properties in bad condition owned by distressed sellers. Yeah. Cause that's really what a, a wholesale deal is. is we call it motivated seller. You really need someone that's distressed to sell it for 40 cents on the dollar. Right. right. You just need someone that's motivated and motivation has a lot of different levels. It's like, Hey, I kind of would like to get a deal done and I want to be out here in four to six months. That's a great opportunity. Mm -hmm. If most people got that phone call today and they're like, yeah, Matt, I got your postcard. They're like, okay, cool. You thinking about selling? They're like, yeah, three to six months, maybe. And you're like, Oh, okay. Well, that's not exciting. You go, what are you looking to get for? And they're like, yeah, I looked up Zillow. I want to get about 85% of Zillow. And you're like, dude, I can't help you. What are you crazy? I got to make a couple bucks and you get rid of the lead. Once you learn novations, you go, dude, Eric, I'll be out there in an hour. That sounds like an awesome opportunity for me. Cause if I can get them from, I want 85% down to 80% and they'll say, yeah, I don't mind if you close in 90 days, I don't need to be out of here for four months. And I'd rather you not, but if that's what it takes to get the deal done, I don't mind you putting a lockbox on the property and bringing buyers here. Sure. Now all right. of a sudden I got a $30,000 profit on a house I didn't have to fix. I didn't have to pay for it. I bought it from a seller that wasn't distressed. They got more money for me than they did every other person they called. And the buyer was able to buy a house, get inspections and appraisals. And I buttoned up and did the little repairs that were needed. It's a, it's a feel yeah. good story. If you ask me, man, it's everybody wins. I get it. I get it. You'd mentioned something on postcards and then, uh, so it looks like you got a buddy here, Nathan King says, what's up here in New York? See your billboards all the time. Um, yeah. So what's the what's the the best form of marketing for you right now? Is anything changed TV. or you just the same old same TV? TV is, yeah, slaying for me right now. It's uh, it's always been a, a, a top lead producer um, and, and contract producer for me, um, depending on the election cycle and what's going on in the world. Sometimes TV commercials can get pretty expensive and it makes it difficult to make a reasonable cost per contract. But um, right now, TV's stabilized a little bit. Now that we're through the election cycle, I'm not competing with governors and senators for mm -hmm. television space. Um, so uh, then cold calling super inexpensive. We do it in a high volume. Um, it's kind of a grind, though. I don't I don't love the outbound cold call cycle. It's it's a little bit of a grind. Um, mm -hmm. But TV does really well for us. Direct mail is normally our top two or three lead sources, um, but it's, it requires consistency. I've been mailing 60,000 postcards every month for as long as I can remember. And uh, right. yeah, so those are TV, cold calling, texting. I would lump into the same category and direct mails, probably they jockeys for second and third. Got it. Uh, so is your, is your marketing message the same as a traditional real estate investor? And then the novation is just something that you have in your pocket or you actually kind of insinuate that, Hey, I got something special that everybody else doesn't have. You know, that's a good question because I, I started doing novations, mailing out the same postcard I did before I knew how to do them, you know, mm -hmm. uh, yellow letters, black, you know, we'll buy as is cash. Um, the high, I think the, re well, now that I say it out loud, TV does so well for me because it doesn't have a focus on distress. You can't run commercials on a frustrated landlord channel. You can't run commercials on a pre foreclosure channel. So the reason TV does so well for me is because I get my largest profit deals on novations from there because it's generally a higher priced property from a non distressed seller that's seeking maybe a, you know, alternative to, to what their experience has been on the open market, but they don't have to sell. They just kind of would like it if they could get their number and they don't want to deal with whatever their perceived hassle is of, dealing with a real estate agent. Um, yeah, so you, you can, I mean, I, I generally, I, so I water down the message a little bit and I make it less about as is cash distress. And it's more of like, Hey, would you, would you like to sell your house a convenient, more predictable way than what generally is out there and available? 
Um, if that's the case, why don't you call us and we'll talk about whether or not we're a good fit. So we've we've softened up the message. It wasn't specific innovations. I just realized after 15 years of doing this, people started to tune out a little bit like the bold, like cash as is close in seven days. A lot of our sellers want to close in seven months. Right. Like they're like, yeah, I'd like to get it buttoned up right now, but I don't know where the heck I'm moving and I need three or four months to figure that out. And we want to make sure that they know that we can work around those timelines. So we just go ahead and put it in our marketing. Right. You know, I'm, I'm here in Vegas and I was over at uh, Ryan Pineda's office, I don't know, two or three months ago. And I'd asked him yeah. this question, what is he doing for marketing? He says he only does TV. He has done TV forever and he doesn't do anything. It brings in more business than he can handle. And I was at my cousin's house in, uh, in uh, Flagstaff for Super Bowl weekend. And these were obviously local commercials, but I, there were four different I buy houses commercials during the Super Bowl. And, uh, you know, so and you'd mentioned your cost per contract. So is TV just so much more accessible right now? I mean, you got a thousand channels on your cable. So now you got all this dispersed energy and attention. So is it cheaper now? It's um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's and it's i think ryan and i use the same guy and that guy is one of the more prominent dudes in that scottsdale phoenix arizona area his name's doug hopkins and okay. um he's uh he's kind of the pioneer that was doing tv 25 years ago in arizona um he's got a you know kick butt business out there he does i don't know something like thousand deals a year between phoenix and la he's in two different markets and all they do is tv it's always ever done and he figured it out and it just, I'm, I'm, I'm finding this out with radio now. I tried radio 10 times over the last 15 years, and I always stunk at it. And I came across a person that figured out radio. And I paid him enough money where they gave me the plan of how they do it. And they said, you got to call 10 radio stations. You ask for, you know, these type of spots. They're the ones they are going to tell you they don't sell. They're free to people that do, but you can buy them for $15 for a 60-second spot. And the first mm -hmm. radio people I called said, no way, we'll never sell it for that. They called me back two weeks later, just like the guy told me they would, and said, hey, we've been thinking about it. If you spend five grand, we'll give you that. I started running radio ads three weeks ago, like mm -hmm. clockwork, getting 15 leads a week off of $1,000 spent. Um, but I hadn't figured it out. I was doing radio, but I was doing it the wrong way. TV's the same thing. Get someone that understands real estate and TV and how they work together. You got to run the right type of ad on the right demographic, the right amount of frequency. Um, yeah. And if you hit that tipping point, just like mail and PPC and texting, cold calling, um, if you do it long enough and do it the right way, you'll get results. Fantastic. Um, think back when uh, your first few innovations and how many you've done now, well, if someone was thinking about getting into innovations and wanted to take this on, what is like the big lesson that you wish you would have known before you took on your first one? How many people actually say yes to it in comparison to what we think? Every time I talk to them, well, why wouldn't they just list it? I don't know. Why don't you ask them? What? Hey, Matt, just <clears throat> curious. Any reason why you wouldn't just list this yourself? They'll tell you. Yeah, I no, think totally. real estate agents are crooks or... You wouldn't believe yeah. how many people just think real estate agents make too much money. They'll let you as an investor make 30 before they pay a real estate agent 10 to get them the additional money. Mm -hmm. It's, 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 you know, it's unfortunate for real estate agents. I think they're drastically undervalued by most people in, in the marketplace because uh, they don't understand all the crap that happens behind the scenes that your real estate agent does for you. Um, that keeps you able to, you know, just kind of cruise along and think everything that's okay and show up at settlement. But um, that's the biggest thing. I would get in my own way. Well, they probably won't do it. They're not going to say yes. Why wouldn't they just list it? Their house is in perfect shape. And then I just got in the habit. The number one thing you have to do to be successful at innovations and really anything is the consistency and the discipline to do it every single time. You make a cash offer, they say no, go, Matt, I'm not sure I can get you qualified for this. But we have an equity protection program that allows us to sometimes pay 20, 30 percent more for houses. If I could get you qualified for that with my underwriter, any chance you'd want to hear more about it? And they'll go, well, yeah, how's that work? 20, 30. You mean you could maybe get me 80 grand more? Maybe I'd have to ask. But if you want to hear more, I'd be happy to talk you through it. And they'll go, well, yeah, how's that work? 
right? And if you just disciplined enough to make the offer to every single person that says no to your wholesale offer, you will be amazed at how many people will go, yeah, man, that sounds good. Let's do it. Mm -hmm. Right? Because I mean, at this point, you've been with someone 45 minutes, an hour, an hour and a half. When you walk out and they haven't sold their house, you got to try and put yourself in their shoes. They are disappointed. I thought I could maybe sell my house today. I was optimistic I could get enough money for it. I really like Matt. I trust him. He just wouldn't come up enough to make the deal work. I guess I got to go interview another 37 people. Who the heck wants to do that? Nobody. You really let people down when you don't you don't help them solve their problem. And too many investors try and fit it in this fix and flip 70% box. There's yep. a thousand different ways or a million different ways to make a million bucks, like you said. There's a thousand different ways to make a deal work with a seller. This is just another one that most people aren't paying attention to. Awesome. You know, you, you said something as, as I started smiling because, you know, these deals, they're not found, they're created. And it's all in the presentation. It's all in the conversation. And I just heard a couple of your, your ninja words right there, our, our equity preservation program. You know, it's yeah. just like, who doesn't want a piece of that, right? Yeah. And I tell them a little story. It's like, you know what, Matt? Yeah. Eight out of 10 people I would make this type of offer to, they said, no way, get out of my house. You're a scam artist. And it's like, it's really hard for me as a salesperson to go every day. I'm going to talk to 10 people and eight of them are going to kick me out of their house because they don't like the number. So I went back to my boss and I said, boss, you got to help me here. And they go, what? And I go, we got to figure out a way to pay, pay people more money for their houses. He goes, you're crazy. And he kicked me out of his office. So I got kicked out of a house that day and I got kicked out of his office. And I said, no, really, if we could pay them more money for their house and still be a smart investor, why wouldn't we do that? And he goes, what do you mean? And I said, there's got to be a way where I could pay somebody maybe 20, 30, 40,000 dollars more for their house. And if we could squeak out a couple bucks profit, but we didn't have to fix it up. Maybe I didn't have to pay for it and go borrow money and all that crap. And if we could make less than what we like to make on a flip, maybe half, but I did half of the work, wouldn't that be a smart investor? Sometimes less is more, right? And he said, I don't know, you might be onto something. So we invested a lot of time. We spent a ton of time with our real estate agent, our real estate broker, buyers and sellers in the marketplace. We spent a ton of money with our attorneys, making sure that the paperwork was 100% transparent and 100% legal. And that's how we rolled out this equity protection program. But I'm getting ahead of myself. You probably don't even want anything to do with it. You that. don't want to hear about that. That's yeah. Nah, nah, there's no no way you would go no, you know, court. You know the rest of that story, right? But yeah. yeah, it's fun to actually, you know, say that, hey, I care about people. I want to help more customers. Cause selfishly we look at it and say, well, we're doing more deals and making more money. But you really have to look at it from these people reach out to you because they want help. And every time you don't solve their problem you've turned away somebody that asked you for help. And for me, I, I don't like that feeling. When someone asks for help, I try and do my damnness to help them. And if I can make some money while I'm doing it, why the heck wouldn't I do it? Uh, there's a friend of mine, Matt Andrews says, the only reason you wouldn't do novations is because you don't know how. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. So, I'm sitting here thinking the same thing of how many people I said <laughs> no to this week. Sorry. Next. Not, here's, a, here's what I'll tell you, Matt. When you know they're a good fit, they're going, Matt, this sounds pretty good, but I don't want to give it away. There should be an alarm that goes off in your head that goes, oh, this might be a good innovation. Or they'll say, this sounds really good, man, but I'm just not in any hurry. Yep. When you hear those two things, which I hear a lot, you should go, yep. well, you know, now that you mention it, this might be a good fit for our equity protection program. And then you just go in to say, here's how it works. You give me access, reasonable access, permission to take it to the open market. Mr. Seller, you give me those two things. I feel like I might be able to get you the additional money you're looking for. You want to make a trade? Mm -hmm. You got, so, you mentioned the uh, like the wholesaling quick and dirty math formula, right? The ARV seventy percent minus repairs. Mm -hmm. um, what's your? Do you have a quick and dirty math formula for your innovations? <laughs> so I actually give. You can go to BrewerMethod.com. I have an innovation calculator there. Get out of here! Um, really? Yeah, yeah, it's free. Um, but uh, effectively. Um, really, you just take, so forget about ARV, MAO, ABC, EFG, all that crap. CCRV, current condition retail value mm -hmm. times 85%. Anything north of 250, you'll make over 20 grand, not have to paint it, not have to side it, not have to pay for it. You can make over $20,000 um, on a wholesale style transaction on a property that's in wholesale condition. 
CCRV, 85%. Nice, nice. Yeah, so if you're looking forward to uh, adding this to your real estate investing toolbox, go to brewermethod.com. I've never heard anyone explain it in the way that Eric has explained it. It's obvious that he's done it many times before, and I can tell right off the bat just from his conversation because I know what those conversations sound like. So, dude, I'm glad we got to meet, and I'm going to go check it out myself. Right now, with all of my conversations, I always go for the lowball price first. Yep. And if that doesn't work, it's great. I can give you a higher price. The market might allow me to give you a higher price if I can give you some money now and the rest later. Right. So I'm going for the, the seller financing option. And then the third one's like, well, you only have one other option. You can go for the retail market and I can go ahead and coordinate a listing uh, appointment with my real estate agent. So which one would you like to do? But now I'm going to throw that one out the window and let's do this novation agreement. Yeah, because how many times do you refer to an agent? They told you they'd take 200. You couldn't make the deal work on your first two options. Agent's listed for 239. It sells in three days. Agent pockets good money. They might kick you a little referral, which is cool. It's a great way to monetize leads. And like I said, at the end of the day, you help the seller, which is the most important thing, right? You got their home sold, yeah. which is what they contacted you for. But every, every one of those refer, and here's the great news. The listing agent's still going to get the listing. They're still going to get it. Yes, you're still going to yeah. make the friend. I get it. Yeah, right? yeah, great. right. So like it's, they, it's half of them can't close anyway. So I'm just they need you. I'm having dinner right now. I can't come over and take it right now. I was like, well, I'll do it for you. Yeah, you can list it yeah. for me. Yeah. Yes, you can list it for me. Yeah, it's a great option. I love it. I love it. All right. So if you want to know more about Novations and Mr. Eric Brewer, go to BrewerMethod.com. It's right there on your screen. If you're listening on the podcast, that's Brewer method.com uh any parting words anything i should have asked that i forgot to eric no i don't think so man this was a good dialogue you asked some really good questions um it's helpful for me to go back i love the question that you asked about what would you do differently or what piece of advice would you have if you started over and that was the thing that got in my way was i i just I had these limiting beliefs that no one will ever go for this and turns out way more way more people will accept that offer than they will 70% of ARV minus reno, you'll be, you'll start doing more of these deals than you do wholesale deals. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> you don't have to, you don't have to convince me. That's yeah. perfect. All right. Well, Eric, it's a pleasure. Let's stay in touch. And yeah. um, that's it for today. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time on the Epic Real Estate Investing Show.